We have Cyrine Bernard here with us. Cyrine is a professor in cognitive and systems neuroscience at the University of Amsterdam, where he's leading the cognitive systems neuroscience group. His research focuses on uh, neural mechanisms of perception and multisensory integration. And also Cyril is, uh, was the chair of the first ever MESSEC event. So we're very happy uh, that you're back with us today to talk about your theory of neurorepresentationalism. Yeah, thanks, Ronnie. Um, and uh, yeah, pleasure to be back. Um, I think the current location in the shore where you are is probably even more spectacular than the one at Campo Moro, uh, which was the first MESEC uh, location. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, predictive processing, multi-level representations, and compare some theories of consciousness in the framework of neurorepresentationalism. Uh, more about this later. This is the group at um, the University of Amsterdam, where we are. And um, in principle, I'll, I'll talk straight through uh, for 45 minutes, unless you have um, acute questions. Um, otherwise, we take the discussion and do it uh, afterwards. Um, so um, the talk is set up in three parts. Uh, first, a little bit about what neurorepresentation is as a theory of consciousness how it relates to predictive processing. And we're gonna take one key prediction of the theory and um, test that one in mice, so in an animal model. And then hopefully there's time left for uh, comparing some theories of consciousness and ask why are they so vastly different. Um, this is an overview of uh, the Intrepid projects that we currently uh, have going for, for just about a year. and. It's uh, an adversarial collaboration, um, as there are several sponsored by the uh, Templeton World Charity Foundation, uh, in this case, to test um, IIT integrated information theory against active inference, um, predictive processing, active inference, and, and neurorepresentationalism. Here are some of the people involved. Uh, there's four experiments led by uh, Umberto Alcese, um, Lars Mukli, Melanie Boli, and Jakob Hoey with the theory leads, uh, except for myself, Carl Fristen and uh, Giulio Tononi. Many people involved in replication experiments and research theory advisory board with um, so Anil Set, uh, for instance, uh, and Aout Sugia, and Lucia Meloni, uh, Wolf Singer and others. It is a big pleasure. I won't talk so much about things that come out, but rather um, take this as a context uh, to talk about uh, NREP, about uh, neurorepresentationalism. Um, so first question for you would be, um, if you look at this illusion called the rotating snakes illusion by Kita Oka, um, then the question is, where are the illusory features located? Um, so this is a question for you as audience. Um, does somebody have an idea I could give maybe you're insensitive to the illusion for me it's quite powerful but maybe not for all of you so is this the illusory feature of rotation is it in the external world the brain is it nowhere or is it none of the above any ideas okay um yeah it's it's fun to do a poll i usually uh, you know uh, in, in in front of a whole uh, take the complete poll of you um, but apparently you agree that it's not in the external world. I would agree because you can't do an objective measurement on this and measure actually that there is movement. However, in the brain, uh, it might be a bit problematic because if a surgeon opens up your brain, do you actually see rotating snakes in there? Uh, I hope not. Um, but you could say, well, there, there is some process going on that might relate to it. <clears throat> so that's, we're going to dive into, um, the answer C nowhere, um, might be maintained because it's actually an illusion. It's not theoretical, but then we still have to explain why there's something happening in front of us, in, in front of you at the screen. Um, so I would more opt for D, none of the above, and say, well, um, what we have to look for is a brain process probably, because this is dependent on the brain, that uh, somehow explains uh, that, yeah, we have a representation that has this illusory property of rotation and is experienced outside of ourselves. Uh, as if happening in the external environment, uh, which also means that it has to be embedded in a larger representation of space, a kind of virtual reality um, rendering of how the brain thinks the world looks like, um, <clears throat> however, without being um, physically accurate. <clears throat> um, so that would be the philosophical position of representationalism. 
um, and neural representationalism is, is about how to how that might work in the brain then so um, the link to uh, consciousness from the brain <clears throat> Okay, uh, thanks so far for your uh, response. Um, this is to provide a little context about what we're talking about. So consciousness as um, um, as, as appearance, as, as phenomena that um, somehow the brain constructs, but that we experience as happening outside ourselves. Um, one could uh, certainly attempt to define consciousness head on, um, but that might be difficult. Uh, there's usually some circularity there. So we can also ask what are its hallmarks and um, also note that modes of healthy consciousness would be perception, imagery, dreaming, uh, imagery and dreaming being more internally driven, perception more driven by external stimuli. And uh, for instance, in, in such a painting like uh, Renoir, um, one might recognize a lot of visual quality. So the proposal here is that yeah, consciousness involves a lot of qual qualitative richness or multiple modalities uh, within vision within the painting you would already recognize shape color texture um, shining brightness um, and so on perhaps suggested movement um, but um, actually consciousness is, is more than that conscious experience is also experience like on the right this lady standing in front of the painting looking at it uh, which holds that uh, you also have a certain body position in space um, and that plays into the vestibular senses um, proprioception like as indicated by spindles in your muscles about how your body is positioned um, touch uh, audition etc so uh, conscious experience is more about the whole gamut of uh, qualia of, of multi-modalities not that they all have to be very pointedly present at the same time, but rather they can also be in the background, but it does matter whether the lady, for instance, stands upright or lies down uh, in front of the picture. That also links, links then to, to situatedness, to immersiveness, which holds that conscious experience, we're, we're set in a situation, like you wake up in the morning and what do you notice? Well, you're lying in bed and there's maybe light through the curtains. In the sure, probably uh, also quite hot uh, or warm in the early morning. So you're immersed, you're sort of in the middle of this situation, which is related to perspectiveness. And then um, let's see how to move on. Uh, integration or unity uh, probably came up before with IIT, but here it's also the, yeah, the binding of uh, features that belong to the same object, uh, the, the integration between the senses, like this ventriloquist, where you attribute uh, the um, sound actually from the man, the ventriloquist here to the moving lips of the puppet. There's an attribution here going on and, and, and the unification into a visual multimodal scene. Um, then dynamic sensibility, very important, the ability to allow for change in conscious experience to happen either by um, body movement or by external objects moving about, but also uh, stability or constancy. Uh, this picture is by David Hockney, um, recently I saw it in Haarlem in Holland and he took snapshots during a Scrabble game and it sort of indicates yeah, the, the visual snapshots that you would have through a camera but also how normal visual perception differs from this, namely building a, a scene that actually looks continuous, it's not, it doesn't have this discontinuity of the snapshot so there is an ability to correct and take along eye movements uh, while we see uh, and that generates a certain stability as the world being constant, as, as having stability, but also objects having a certain invariance to them, even if there's um, movement going on. <clears throat> and a key overarching concept here is interpretation, inference, and intentionality, which um, holds that, uh, yeah, we do watch or perceive vegetables, uh, but we don't have them in the brain. We don't have rotating snakes literally in the brain. We do have neurons in the brain that somehow um, are able to code something that is about something else than themselves. So inference about what is happening in the outside world in the case of perception. Intentionality being very much the philosophical counterpart of aboutness that, that those neurons collectively are able to uh, generate um, codes that are about something else like vegetables than being outside. Um, a key discussion point also in the Intrepid um, Templeton collaboration that we have is, is about motor activity 
And uh, for instance, active entrance or embodiment views have it that yes, sensory motor interaction with the environment is essential for consciousness. That's not per se what I would maintain here, um, because there are also cases of, for instance, Amelia, where people are born without limbs. They, they have a congenital absence of limbs. Um, but even in the absence of that sensory motor history, they are able to have feelings in those limbs. So in other words, phantom sensations in fingers that they never had. It sort of proves the point that, yeah, direct sensory motor loops are not always necessary to sustain conscious experience. So it must come from the brain, specifically the somatosensory cortex and connected parts. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, functions of consciousness. Um, whole debates here it could be good for a session on its own, uh, for sure. Um, but I'd just like to propose here that consciousness does have a function and that relates to this little toad in front of the iPhone. Um, I'm going to show you what it does. <laughs> now watch what happens with the finger of the traitor, of the deceiver. <laughs> um, yeah, revenge of um, <clears throat> revenge of the toad uh, to its uh, deceiver. Um, the point being, though, that, uh, yeah, in order to appreciate that this is all fake, uh, the toad would have to know not so much how iPhones work, but understand the context. If there's no like, contextualization of the bug creeping across the screen, um, then you're sort of lost in this task and the frog indeed will keep on responding. Uh, amphibians indeed have little or no uh, cerebral cortex, uh, but they do have an optic tectum that has been described as a, as a bug detector. Um, so, uh, if we think of functionality of consciousness, then uh, consider contextuality, the embedding of stimuli into context. Uh, and that links to this uh, particular slide, which expands on this. Uh, Dobbs Hansky was a Ukrainian geneticist, and he actually said, well, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Um, and that's an important statement because also consciousness could be regarded as a biological phenomenon, of course, also psychological, that would be part of biology. Um, so let's consider uh, consciousness as a biological phenomenon that uh, then would have to subserve some kind of function in the survival or reproduction of organisms. Um, and there it's relevant to make a distinction between the kind of actions that we have at our disposal to survive, um, reproduction leaving aside, one type is reflexes and habits. Basically, these are regarded largely as executed unconsciously. Um, they have a stimulus response character. They're in a way low dimensional. So like this tadpole could, when um, detecting a kind of looming uh, change in shadow approaching by this bird touching upon the water, uh, could duck away simply. And that could be done in a reflex. Very fast, very effective, but you don't need consciousness for it. No like survey of the um, scene that you have, or take um, uh, the hand on the hot stove, also withdrawn in a reflex, very fast, very effective. You're usually only conscious afterwards. And it's very interesting to think about why we are consciously uh, aware of this afterwards, even though your hand might already have been saved. Uh, so maybe we discuss that later. Uh, the point being that um, the other kinds of actions that we um, consider, that we talk about, are goal-directed behaviors. And that's not so much about pure goal-directedness, that would be also eye movements that are directed at some object, uh, but more about behaviors that require actually a representation of the goal before the action takes place, like a planning and deliberation of the action options. What is there? What are the benefits? What are the costs? And that is symbolized by this tree-like diagram here, where the present indicates your current position and the branches symbolize all the options that you have. Like you're in this room in the shore, you have options like going to the coffee machine or continue to listen to my talk. Um, and then you have to choose. You can deliberate and weigh all the actions against each other. So these are more complex multifactorial decisions where there's a whole space of action options for the future. And then the question is, how do you select those goals? Uh, how do you 
do that, well, you need information. And one of the pieces of information, apart from memory, etc., is what is around you. So you need this multimodal survey of the situation around you, including your bodies. Um, so where are you in space? Um, what do you have around you? Let's consider the chimpanzee here as it um, looks around, uh, might be hungry. It looks for tools to uh, access this uh, termite um, um, hill. And then uh, using the multimodal information from its situation, from its environment, including where it is, it can find such a stick to uh, poke for the ants. So um, th that means this environmental information is really useful, but you also need uh, the context. It's it's a larger thing that we need to, to make these complex decisions. So here, uh, consciousness would not equate with deliberate actions, but rather uh, supports them by offering this multimodal immersive si situational uh, survey. And that would amount to a definition. Uh, and this acts more on the medium to fast time scale, as opposed to reflexes, which uh, are faster. Um, and then, yeah, the basis, so we're going into brain mechanisms of how that could happen the building of representations for perception um i'm going to talk a little bit here about sensory based uh, predictive coding models um and i think you had some of this by shamil right maybe in the workshop um but it's, it's basically you know going back to emmanuel kant who said well we we, we see appearances indeed we don't have access to the ding an sich, the thing in itself in the outside world. All we get, all the brain gets, is sensory information about this, let's say, real world horse in a depiction of Shirandora from our lab. It is projected on the retina on some input layer and then fed forward to uh, the brain, the thalamus, of course, in the cortex. Um, and then Helmholtz already recognized the principle of sensory inference that. Yeah, all the all the things that the brain gets is sensory information plus it sends out motor commands um, but these are basically action potentials it has to cope with that and try to make sense of the inputs by building a kind of yeah a representation or a hypothesis of what's going on and that's the work of these higher layers these gray uh, boxes with neurons um, that actually contain or uh, latent representations or the causes the models of what is causing the sensory input. And the idea with predictive coding then is, is that you have this input, the higher layers generate predictions or hypotheses, they're going down, they're fed back to the lower layers. By comparison and subtraction with the actual sensory input, you compute an error that is then between the prediction and the actual sensory input, and that is fed forward to the higher layers to improve the inference, to improve the predictions, uh, but also to learn from it. And those can be distinct processes. Sometimes you have uh, completed learning in such a network, um, but there's still inference to be improved given a certain input. Um, so that means that we're talking about predictions in the sense of um, inferring the current uh, sensory inputs, not so much the future actually, and predictions are more or less equivalent to representations and to hypotheses. Um, so that's what we would be doing. We're never certain the brain is, is making best guesses of what's going on. This is matter already worked out by, for instance, Mumford, but also Ron Ballard and Peter Dian in their models. Um, what we did in the lab um, is the more neurobiological approach. So to say, well, we want to scale up this predictive coding uh, around Ballard, for instance, worked with two layers, we went to five, and uh, the learning has to be unsupervised, like we suppose happens in the brain by, by Hebbian principles, and in a neural network form. So this is different from the Bayesian formal frameworks, Bayesian statistics, um, as of uh, Carl Fristen, for instance, uh, with working with policies. These, these are actually model neurons that try to do this. Uh, and Shurandora in the lab indeed was able to show that you can build a scalable five-layer network where you train the network on input images like horses and other living things. Then you want the network to generatively reconstruct the image from the latent representation. So you tickle the network up here in the higher layers and then it has to reproduce in the input layer the original image, which is really important because that might link to imagery in, in the way of a top-down regeneration of um, sensory imagery. Um, and the network is able to do this for novel images as well. So it has learned the statistics of images deal with novel inputs. 
Um, but now, importantly, uh, we're extending this predictive coding framework for other capacities. Um, so whereas originally predictive coding is very much about being able to reproduce the original image, um, we uh, asked with Matthias Bruklacher and Sander Boutte, can we extend this, for instance, to include constancy and invariant object recognition? So can we build a network that does both the specific image representation and have object invariance to it? Uh, the problem is, is like depicted here, uh, the apple is rolling along on various time movements, so it changes in appearance, yet we also recognize in our conscious experience that it stays the same apple. Uh, that might seem entirely self-evident, but considering all the shape changes and whatever could happen, this is not a given, but still <coughs> to grab the same apple, that is, you identify the apple as being the same, as being uh, an edible object, and then you have to take into account its specific image to grab it correctly, right? Um, so Matthias trained um, a network here derived from Schirren's model uh, with moving digits, moving MNIST, um, moving in translational uh, way or uh, expanding on the screen or shrinking, rotating uh, different toy objects, and was able to show the following. Let me show you the simulation. This is actually a small network with area one being sort of comparable to v1 and there you see a sort of retinal projection of a digit five moving from left to right then below that you have various um, layers like area two area three and area four you suppose that area four then comes more to resemble infratemporal cortex and what you actually see is that is that this representation here in area two still changes a lot as the image is moving across retinotopic space, that's logical. But in area four, you see uh, quite naturally emerging a representation that is pretty constant. So these are the same neurons that keep on firing, even though the image is moving. And that entails some image stability, so um, a stable activity pattern, even though the, the gray values are still varying. Um, so that amounts to a network um, that is able to have some object invariance even though there's translation or rotation happening. Um, and so, for instance, in this representational cosine similarity matrix, um, you see how, uh, for instance, this blue square would represent, for instance, the MNIST digit two that is moving in sequence. Uh, those uh, representations in the higher layer, let's say the infratemporal cortex model, are very similar. So the dissimilarity is very low. Whereas uh, input two versus five over here are in the yellow uh, zone. That is a very high dissimilarity. In other words, the network is able to code at this high level, great dissimilarity between different sequences, different digits, but a high similarity uh, within the sequence uh, when it's about the same digit. Why is it interesting? Well, uh, we consider this um, to catch one aspect of object perception, which is both the specificity and the invariance or constancy uh, that we talked about. The network is also able to um, to show sensitivity to this Kanisha illusion, for instance. I uh, don't have the time to fully explain it, um, but it comes down to training a network um, in area two, area three, and then the lower area one, first on, let's say, the natural world of triangles and squares. So you present a lot of triangles and squares to the network. Uh, but then in a test stage, you present the Spec-Man shapes, the inducers. Uh, where we as humans already recognize a kind of illusion of um, a square or a triangle. Now, area one, the low level area, tends to reproduce the Pac-Mans to represent it, but sometimes also the inferred squares. The higher areas almost exclusively generate um, the global uh, concepts of, of squares and triangles. So that shows um, uh, some ability to, uh, to be sensitive to these uh, illusion inducers. Um, but we also feel uh, that something is still lacking in classical predictive coding, at least when you want to take this to uh, consciousness. And what is exactly lacking? What is the problem? I mean, we, we do have inference now. We, we do have even some level of object invariance and, and other things going on. Um, but yeah, this qualitative richness of experience or qualia are not sufficiently represented in those models, um, I feel, because um, you could say, well, it's still a computational model, it's number crunching, which is beautiful, but 
there's no, let's say, emergence of color perception or particular qualia. The problem is not so much that there are not enough feature detectors, not enough sensor types, um, even in models or robots. That's, um, that's all present in, in the skin or what have you. Uh, you can also model this. Uh, there's a problem in, in how um, the brain comes basically to recognize or identify the inputs it gets. And that's because, contra to uh, Johannes Müller, the inputs arrive unlabeled. Um, it means that, anatomically speaking, you know, we have, of course, cranial nerves, an optic nerve that conveys visual information. The problem uh, arises when those action potentials conveyed across the optic nerve arrive in a piece of cortex. And those neurons there, uh, they don't have the anatomical knowledge of where the action potentials come from. So they have no intrinsic knowledge, so to say, that it's about vision. Uh, there's no welcome sign here to say that the action potentials enter the visual cortex and from then on it's all visual. So the vision has to be constructed, it has to be made uh, to happen. Um, and that's not a, a natural, so that, that's, that's a, a missing point in uh, Müller's labeled lines hypothesis of the uh, 19th century. Actually, Müller was the uh, mentor of Helmholtz. Um, also, in classical neural nets, we have to recognize that inputs and outputs remain unidentified. This is also why the current AIs, deep learners, are not so much um, yeah, aware of, they have no knowledge of what they process unless you build in special things that do that. So they have no intentionality, no qualia. And also in this case, um, this is an example from a Dutch book I wrote. I, I hope it's translated quite soon. Um, we have, um, we suppose, a very simple organism like paramecium that has only one light sensor. And um, that light sensor transmits action potentials like one, four, four, five spikes per second, etc., that drive the motor movement phototaxis towards the light source, right? That's what you see happening in all kinds of small organisms. The point, however, being that this is um, adaptive behavior, it's sensitive to the stimuli, but from those exponentials alone, you cannot derive that it's about light, that, that it's about photic information, even though the organism is seen to be driven towards a light source. So with one sensor, you simply cannot uh, have um, yeah, consciousness in the sense of knowing or identifying what your sensory input is about. This intentionality is utterly lacking. So that also means that consciousness does not equate with behavioral sensitivity, uh, which sometimes then is equated with sentience. Uh, so sentience to me is, is a bit of a vague concept. And if you translate it as behavioral sensitivity, it's certainly most not equal to, to conscious experience. Um, what we do find useful is to think about um, uh, modality identification, in a way, uh, thinking about qualia as involving interactions between multimodal networks. And I have to be brief about this, but um, what we envisage is this, for instance, for vision, the visual cortical hierarchy, like going from LGN up to infotemporal cortex and what have you, but that the modalities also have to interact. And that's because on their own, uh, a visual sensor, again, is not sufficient as a standalone feature detector to know what kind of information it is processing. Um, it is by the multimodal topology that arises differentially across other hierarchies, audition, taste, affection, etc., all interacting also with the executive and motor systems, that a topology arises where you could say, well, here we have some unique input that could only be interpreted as visual uh, because it has a certain statistics either correlating to the rest or not. And then when you shut your eyes, correlations with other senses will, will cease to be. Uh, so it also defines uh, a point of uniqueness in that um, uh, topological space. So here the qualitative properties must be inferred from relational high-level network properties in addition to, uh, let's say, unique uh, feature detectors as for color, etc. Color is quite unique, of course, to vision. Uh, for NREP, it means that there's a prediction that the sensory modalities will uh, have to interact with each other, at least at the neocortical level. And we're going to look at this a bit. Um, the next slide is, um, in a way, about how to reconcile and tackle the hard problem, to approach it from a certain viewpoint. Up here, uh, there's the inspiration from David Marr, as you see, um, a, a genius in computational neuroscience that made the very important distinction between the implementation level of computations, that is 
synapses, fatty acid membranes, etc., all the wet stuff of the brain versus the computational and algorithmic levels. But it's a conceptual distinction where you say, well, if you know everything there is to know about fatty, fatty acids, you will still not understand the brain because you also have to understand it at a different conceptual level. And uh, the argument here I make is that a bit similar in that spirit, um, we can also think of, let's say, the low level stuff of cell assemblies versus the high level phenomenal experiential stuff that uh, is felt as uh, perception uh, at this high level. And the idea is that at the very low level of assemblies, we have small predictive coding networks that builds hypotheses about, let's say, the shape of something or the motion or the color, and that um, they will have to be integrated into bigger hypotheses uh, about visual objects, for instance, so that um, you have a specification of what the, the color, the texture, and uh, the shape of a, an object is. Um, and those um, visual objects also have to, to be integrated with auditory and other modal objects like touch. And in, um, in total, at a still yet higher level, the modalities need to be integrated also into space. So um, that's why we consider conscious experience to be spatially encompassing. So it's not only about the piece of cheese having a certain smell and a visual appearance and uh, perhaps some uh, taste to it. It's also about representing the larger context of the objects around it. We do have some idea what the um, analogies might be in the brain. Um, so here we think of, of smaller networks um, symbolized here by the red lines connecting particular cells that are involved in common coding of a feature. The meta network level visually would represent the collaboration between different visual areas in the cortex, like involved in color, uh, depth perception, uh, shape, uh, motion information, etc., and the meta, the multimodal meta network level. We have a depiction here from Alan Brain about the fiber connectivities between the different modalities. So that would be a very rough idea of the kind of brain systems involved in mammals. Uh, but remember, this is not a, a type of consciousness that says, "Ah, well, consciousness is high level, so it is in P4 or infratemporal cortex." That's entirely the wrong idea. This is not about scaling levels or anatomical levels. It is about being consciousness in a lot of these uh, areas um, being generated all at the same time in a kind of gigantic uh, super inference uh, process. Um, so we approach the hard problem basically by saying, um, well, yes, there is um, a high level of phenomenal experience, qualitative experience, but also a lower neural level they basically represent the same functionality. So if you abolish the neurons or their neural activity, then also phenomenal experience goes away. Um, with this multi-level basis of thinking, which again is not anatomical levels or V4 versus IT, um, we, um, yeah, you, we're still sort of plagued by the notion that we can imagine the transition to happen between phenomenal qualities and uh, lower level stuff. Um, but this is also a limitation of our imagery, um, I would argue, because we have never been trained to see the correspondence to neurons. That is, our imagery is trained on perception, um, and it means also having no direct access to the underlying neurons. It's a bit comparable to uh, the horror vacuum argument or the Big Bang theory. In the times of Aristotle, people said, well, a vacuum cannot exist because you cannot imagine that a feather in a ball fall at equal speed and therefore a vacuum cannot exist. Also a limitation of the imagery uh, that people just didn't have any experience without knowing it was possible. Big Bang is even more telling because there you could say, well, I can imagine explosions, that's all fine. So it's a kind of Big Bang, but it's harder to imagine how space and time themselves came into existence. That is uh, an explosion still takes time and it takes place in space. Um, so uh, basically what we have to do is infer from this background radiation that there was a Big Bang and we cannot literally imagine how that happens. So a lot of abstract thinking must be accepted. Um, I'll um, briefly present some of the testing of the theory. So now we go to a bit of empirical parts of the talk um, where we do experiments in the lab. They are very important to us and supplement the work on consciousness, uh, in this case in mice. Um, and so we're going to test this prediction of whether these sensory modalities actually interact with each other. We do look at, at a modality identification task 
in the mouse in V1, the primary visual cortex. And the task that uh, Matthijs actually uh, developed here, Matthijs out of Lohuis, was uh, in fact to train the mice on, well, being exposed to a continuous visual stream um, or also auditory streams. At some point, there would be a change in the orientation pattern, vision, or a change in the auditory streams in the composition of the frequency tones. And that change has to be detected by a lick response, let's say lick left to the auditory change and lick right if there was a visual change. These are psychometric curves with hit rates. And you can see that, for instance, catch trials have no uh, sensory change. Uh, so they're sort of fake zero stimuli trials. But the hit rate goes up if the mouse was trained in this multi-sensory fashion. MST means multi-sensory trained. And then it catches um, more and more salient auditory changes. So this is threshold level, super threshold, maximal level. Here on the right, we have orientation changes, so in the visual domain. And we had uh, three cohorts of mice, uh, one being naively uh, exposed, uh, did get rewards and stimuli, but not in a related fashion, no response needed. Uh, UST means unicentry trained, so only on the visual, and MST was the multicentry trained condition. And meanwhile, the uh, silicon probe recordings are made from various areas, but we focus on V1. Because what you see in V1 is quite striking. Um, you see in the um, naive mice, but also on the vision only trained mice and the multisensory responses of V1 cells to auditory input, that is to sounds, they react. And you see in the spike responses across trials, uh, so this is time relative to stimulus onset, that is quite a reliable response already to sound in the visual cortex in naive animals, uh, but also in the unicentric trained, so no auditory relevance for the behavior or the rewards, just trained on vision. And here MST, you see even bigger responses. You see that translated also here on the right with, um, um, again, on the x-axis, the visual trial responses, z-scored on the y-axis, the auditory trials. But especially in the multi-sensory case, you see vigorous auditory responses here next to the visual responses. The question is, how is it indeed strictly auditory or could it be also involving motor consequences? And that's also an important discussion for you because you're probably also considering recurrent processing in a lot of theories and what kind of um, material does that represent? <clears throat> so what we do here is watch the mouse as it responds to the stimuli and you see a lot of orofacial behaviors in these mice. Um, but you could also see that in monkeys, for instance, there's licking, but there's also snout movements, whisker movements, and you can capture this motion by a measure developed by Stringer at all called video motion energy. And you see here like a max would be maximal, maximally salient auditory changes, and they cause a lot of um, visual uh, video motion energy. So a lot of orofacial movement. Now compare this to uh, previous claims from the monkey V1, for instance, Super et al. Uh, worked with uh, Victor Lamme, also here in Amsterdam, and they reported that um, awareness or consciousness coheres very much with the late response of such V1. So um, that would be a claim towards that, that, that you need this recurrent processing occurred over here, the late activity in V1 for consciousness. But it could be, you know, also in monkeys, that it relates actually to motor reports or any motor confounds. And indeed, that's what we find in the mice. Uh, we see that motor activity totally dominates the late response phase of V1 processing. This is likely recurrent processing, but it's not yeah, consciousness per se. So what you see down here is population firing with either visual stimuli 2V1 or auditory stimuli 2V1. The red curve shows that the auditory response is actually falling earlier than the visual response. And this is in V1, right? So it points to a very early transmission of auditory evoked uh, activity to V1. This is a blow up of that uh, time range. Now you can model of what part of the firing rates is explained by the various factors. This is auditory, visual, motor, uh, video, motion, energy. Um, and when you do this regression with a GLM model, you do actually see that the red curve over here, that is again of the V1 responding, represents auditory activity. So that's where cells correlate in the firing to what kind of auditory change was applied. 
whereas the green curve here is the motor activity. So that's, that is correlating with the video motion energy. And it partially overlaps, but the green motor activity is later on average, and it explains a lot of the um, later activity that is supposedly the recurrent processing previously interpreted as consciousness related. It's, it's just uh, hugely motor confounded. Uh, almost sorry to say it, but that's life. Um, uh, there's further evidence for indeed uh, cross-modal processing, as you see. So here is the whole range of V1 neurons as they try to explain their variance from the GLM models by visual variations, auditory variations, motor variations. And you see that the whole population sort of splits up in three groups, a purely visual group, and then auditory in the middle, and then motor. There is some overlap, so there are also cells that do both, for instance, auditory and motor, but also cells that exclusively code either visual or auditory and not motor. Below here, there's a cortical depth profile that shows that a lot of this firing, yeah, you see the visual trials, uh, the yellow blue spots are, let's say, the Z-score activity across the cortical layers. And for the auditory trials, again, looking at V1 is showing a different profile for the auditory predictors being both superficial and deep in the cortex of the mouse, whereas the motor predictors primarily activate the superficial layers in the mouse. So, Again, here you see a dissociation between auditory and motor. Uh, the conclusions here are important um, in line with NREP, but not exclusively supporting this theory, I would say, is that V1 processes multimodal information, including motor, and that the late motor component poses a problem for recurrent processing is consciousness uh, theories. Um, so uh, it, it's not a problem for predictive processing because there uh, the motor efference copies are taken on board anyway to account for uh, how predictions are shaped by motor movements for instance eye movements that shape the predictions about what the animal is going to see next um yeah, i think it's time to wrap up i just wanted to mention perhaps maybe also we can look at roni how we are doing on the time we have 15 more minutes, so up to you. 15. Okay, yeah. Okay, well, just just briefly, perhaps this um, this last part is about um, how to compare theories of consciousness and trying to see why they're often so vastly different. It's work that we did with uh, Katinka Evers and Michele Ferrisco in the Human Brain Project. And it's, it's basically, um, yeah, responding to the need or the the search for a minimal unifying model of consciousness. So it's a question that has been raised, for instance, by Ryota Kanai, uh, but also Vanja Wiese in a paper here, in the search for common denominators. Like, can we not identify across various theories, common denominators that um, are held in common and could serve as a sort of minifying, minimal unifying model, as something that we could work on and say, well, at least that's what they have in common. So we maybe, agree on that as a consciousness theory. Um, so like Wanja Wiese would say, okay, a common denominator has to be a necessary feature of consciousness. You cannot dispense with it. Multiple theories of the uh, consciousness, of course, have to uh, entail it. Um, otherwise it's not common and it might have to serve a unifying function. So information generation, for instance, was suggested as such a common denominator acting across, um, what have we, uh, IIT, Global Neuronal Workspace, well, predictive processing, why not? Um, it's rather easy to find counter examples, we think, because um, information generation, yeah, it's such a general concept, uh, especially if you rely on Shannon information, that's a statistical concept, you find it throughout nature. Also variational autoencoders have this aspect of hourglass, you, you have input, it is compressed and then decompressed and novel in, information is generated, but that's not sufficient for consciousness. So we took rather the approach from Kuhn, uh, the structure of scientific resolution, uh, rev revolutions, um, and, and contrasting sort of Copernican worldviews uh, against uh, Ptolemy. Um, so we try to dive into uh, what is a paradigm to think about consciousness and what are perhaps common or different background definitions that we have. And then you see across, yeah, basically many, many aspects that we have, like in this table, I won't treat it, but you try to define these common denominators, you find lots of differences. And what you especially find is that consciousness is often regarded as something entirely different. It's not the same object of study 
across theories like global neuronal workspace at least in one version has consciousness as global availability of information so it's not about phenomenal experience content or qualia iit has a stronger emphasis on phenomenal experience certainly um, but it emphasizes very much of course the integration of information and differentiation being based on shannon information and that's a very statistical way of going about consciousness it's not actually about content or uh, semantics and rep and perhaps also active inference is, is more about best guess representations including qualia um, and behavior not being essential that's a point of difference with ai um, so our conclusion is more that theories address widely diverging aspects of consciousness there's no agreement on what consciousness is actually is uh, but once you recognize that, there's also a basis to start integrating theories and try to make them compatible um, as more unifying theories next. Um, so often the disagreements here are about, yeah, the totally different concept of consciousness. <clears throat> so to take away, uh, in conclusion, um, the argument from NREP is that consciousness does have a very clear biological function. Um, it provides us with inference with sensory based representations in the first place motor action not being strictly necessary uh, but often taken on board um, we can uh, take predictive processing certainly as a cornerstone but it's not going to be sufficient to explain consciousness that makes this position i represent also different from other positions um, and that what distinguishes conscious representations from other ones uh, there are lots of predictions in the brain is the wideness spatially and richness so it's really about this rich situational survey or representation um, take on the heart problem being uh, spelled out by these uh, conceptual representational levels um, and uh, taking into account our limited imagery actually and not being able to imagine transitions let's say from orange down to uh, spiking neurons um, we have to accept a certain limitation there um, and then, yeah, in terms of empirical testing, um, there's work happening also, like I said, auditory and motor processing in V1, uh, confounding, yeah, consciousness report correlates um, with motor activity. Um, and then the last point about the comparison is that, yeah, it's, it's sort of important to recognize differences in what we talk about in having consciousness as object of study. Um, well, thanks so far, and I think, I hope there's space left for questions. Let's see. There is, there is. Thank you so much, Cyril.